Good evening, everyone, and welcome. Thank you all so much for coming. And please stay afterwards for the reception. It's great to see everyone. I would like to start by thanking Michael Kaboyak for putting together such a great event. I would also like to thank some of our students um, for helping. You're gonna meet some of them later as they pass around the portable mics. Please use the mics when you ask your questions so that our remote participants can also hear not only the question, but also the, um, not only the answer from the panelists, but also your question. I will leave it to the um, to Alex, our alum, to introduce Ed and Larry more formally in a second. When I was looking forward to this event, I was looking backwards, uh, trying to remember when I first met um, Larry and Ed. Larry, I first met on the phone. You were explaining to me in your wonderful holistic and philosophical way what knowledge really is. That very much intrigued me. Um, at the time, I was only the interim program director, so I could have still jumped ship. Um, you then went on to explain that ICANS had its roots in Columbia's library school. And that got me hooked and that made me fall in love because for me, knowledge is something that needs to be respected, treasured, shared, furthered, et cetera. And um, that's for me what libraries are very much about. Ed, I met for the first time, actually very much in this room when you were leading one of our residencies. And I saw that what I think Larry sometimes describes as knowledge being in between people, that if you have a leader such as Ed Hoffman who can create this atmosphere of everyone feeling comfortable to share, feeling included, uh, to further the knowledge in the organization that can improve the company, make it more valuable, but also quite honestly, make it a more uh, nice place to work. So with that, thank you so much for tonight. Thank you for coming. And I will leave it to Alex to take us further. Thank Enjoy you the much, evening, Rosa. everyone. All right. Uh, let's see. Um, welcome, everybody. Uh, it's tempting to say that, you know, here are two guys from Brooklyn, uh, but actually we can say that, let's see, Larry Prusak is the founder of the IBM Institute for um, <clears throat> Knowledge Management. He's been a senior advisor uh, uh, for firms like ENY, uh, NASA, and the World Bank. And Ed is the former let's see, chief knowledge officer for NASA. So it's quite a powerhouse of, you know, I don't know, knowledge management that we have up here. We're here to talk about their book, The Smart Mission. So I'll start with Larry, if that's okay. Um, what inspired you to write this book? Well, we we all, Ed, myself, the other writer, Matt Cohut, Matt Cohen. and Don Cohen, who wrote one of the chat, we all worked at NASA. Okay. For about 15 years, something like 15 to 20 years. And I thought, because I read a lot, that we really did some interesting and innovative things. They let us do it. And there were things that I didn't find in textbooks on project management, on books, on economics, subjects I'm interested in. I said, we should really let the world know what we did. I mean, I don't want to write an article. Let's write a book. And I had to talk Ed into doing it. I told him the only way to be famous is if we write a book. Sure. And they didn't want to be famous. They didn't want to be famous, but he became famous by writing the book. But it was really, uh, it was really more evangelical. We wanted to spread the news that NASA did some, used certain attributes, to, created certain environments, and put an emphasis on some things like stories and knowledge and learning that generally you don't find in textbooks. So he wrote the book. The book's doing very well, by the way, yeah, that's great. I have to say. Um, how did you pick the title for the book? So, um, well, it's interesting. I mean, one of the things uh, I have to say, I, I didn't, Larry called me one day, I was at the Kennedy Space Center, it's a beautiful day. And he says, you know, you've done a lot of things, but you haven't really written a great book. And I said, that's because I don't really like to write. I like to talk, I like to do things, I'm busy, life is good. I, I don't need to write a book. Uh, but when Larry Prusak calls you and says something, it stays in your brain. I said, okay. And so then I, I did a reverse. I said, Larry, let's do it together. And then we, we pulled in Matt, which ended up being strangely one of the most enjoyable times of my life too. Uh, writing it uh, because of the collaboration and, and going back and forth. Um, in terms of the title, 
uh, we had a wonderful editor uh, from MIT Press, uh, Emily Tabor, brilliant editor. She asked great questions. She would ask questions about things that I thought had been clearly answered. And I realized we hadn't answered it. And when we were struggling with the title, one of the things she says, you know, Ed, whenever you talk about mission, you light up, you get energized and you talk about the importance of it. And I said, mission is everything. Uh, most work is project work. Projects are about missions, about the destinations, about the vision, mm -hmm. NASA, military, all these organizations are driven by something. So it's about the mission, but there's a difference between a smart mission and the opposite. And NASA, you don't talk about that. You talk about smart mission and then ones uh, you know, that are different types. So that was the background. Interesting. But, um, but the, I, I got to touch on the, the origin of it because to me, it was a deeper one that goes further back. Um, students who are here know I always tell stories. The story for this book really started uh, uh, about 2000, uh, about the year 2000. And what was happening, I was working at the time, I was the director of the NASA Academy providing development learning uh, for the program project management community at NASA. And uh, we had come off of a series of three painful failures going to Mars. Think of covers of headlines, NASA lost in space, uh, Mars hex, no one's gonna be able to get there. And I was told one day that the administrator, Dan Golden wants you to fly with him down to our education center on the Eastern shore, which was Wild Sign, Virginia. And uh, then I was told no one else will be on that plane. And if you work in an organization, the he whenever the head of the organization goes to any place, everybody and their family yeah, wants to shoot into that plane. Yeah. And uh, so I knew this was an issue. I got a call from his secretary, who was a friend of mine. She said, Ed, Dan's going to be there 545. You better be there by 515. I said, why 515? Because you tend to get places late. And Dan said, if he's late, just fire him. I, I don't want to say. He was furious. He was in a little bit of a depression about the Mars failure. He's angry. So I get on the plane for about 20 minutes of a 30-minute flight from Washington to, uh, to Wallops Island, Virginia. It's totally quiet, teetotaling quiet. So I figured, okay, I got through this thing. All of a sudden, I see Dan staring at me. And uh, just like where you were sitting, Carolina, he, he, <laughs> he had a habit. He would point his finger when he was angry. And what he says to me is, do you want to know why I hate you so much? And I, you know, weird things go through my head. What went through my head is my parents were dead. And if only they, they knew what their son was experiencing right now. And uh, being the dork was, I said, no, but yeah, I'd like to know, why do you hate me? And he says, I hold you accountable for the Mars failures. Wow. Yeah, that was my reaction. Didn't think I could have that kind of impact on anything. Before I can say anything, he said, shut up. I'm going to tell you something now. And uh, I was thinking about my family. I like this job and, you know. But okay, where am I going to go from here? And he said, you deceived the leadership. And when he said that, that really hurt me. And it really, you know, because that's not what I'm about. And he said, um, you led us to believe we have this great training program. All the project managers are trained. They have their competencies. They're certified. They have everything. And when I spoke to these teams, what they all said is that when it came to how they communicated together, how they found their knowledge, how they shared it, uh, how they worked as a team, that that was the things that, that came to the problem. If you read any of these reports, it's an embarrassing report because they're not about the technical failure. They're not about the process failures. They're about humans. Uh, and many of the students have read those things. And um, it was tough because I remember thinking my degree from Columbia University was in organization development. Everything focuses on the teams, the systems. How do you work together? Right. And we were focusing on the individual training. And uh, he basically said, you have two months to figure out how we get our project folks to work effectively in teams and to uh, understand knowledge and how it flows and all these things, or, or we're going to send you someplace else, basically. So the thing that, that I would say about that is there's two things I remember thinking about. One is everything NASA does is project. And that projects, which up until that point, I thought was largely logical and rational. If you have the processes right, it'll flow. That was completely wrong. That it's largely about the intangibles. That's about communication. It's about teams. It's how people communicate to each other. It's dealing with failure, dealing with innovation. It's where do you find knowledge? How do you get people to talk when they don't want to tell you things? Right. And uh, that became the driving point of really the rest of our career. That's when we started working together in knowledge and Weird things at the time, like storytelling and 
What does projects have to do? The people in the project community got all these things immediately, mm. but others uh, took a little bit while. So, so, so that was the notion of the smart mission. It's interesting. So. How do you train those folks that don't have those competencies? How do you work on kind of teaching them storytelling? How do you teach them how to be engaged in things like that? It if it's not what they think it works. Be done. Yeah. It's not that hard to do that. No. You could teach people the value of narratives and stories. We all live by narratives and stories. You may not know it, but we all do. Your sense of identity is a sense of a story. So it wasn't that hard, although Ed had me give me a talk, had me do a talk one time at one of these big NASA meetings. And the man who was speaking was one of the senior NASA engineers. And I had to tell him, he said, you, you can't use PowerPoint. You have to tell them a narrative. And he looked at me, he says, you mean like the three bears? <laughs> I wow. said, no, 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 not the three bears. And he understood it. And the, I was watching the audience and I loved it. You know, it, it really works. Stories stick. They stick. PowerPoints, people, those off. Actually, the project community, uh, they got it first. When I think, and, and some of the senior leaders project took, say a project is a story. You know, you have a challenge, you have a destination, you're always dealing with dragons, there's always issues and you get to get there. So they tend to talk, if you will, in stories. So they appreciate it. The biggest challenge we had at the start was time. That the NASA folks, uh, when we started doing this thing, they were used to just, just keep moving, doing things. It doesn't matter what you're doing, doing things. So leadership thinks you're being busy, reorganized or something. And what they were starting to tell me uh, was uh, we don't really have the permission to just come together and talk to do what we're doing right here. And so we had to, and we discussed it with the senior leadership, and what we had to start doing was creating this notion of a learning organization, in essence, giving permission for project folks, engineers, scientists to take an hour, take two hours, take a day to talk about their issues and share uh, what it takes to be successful in a mission. Sure. Uh, but they got it. They understood it. They didn't think their executives would get it. Yeah, I was going to say, I mean, like what you're describing is a is a place where the executives like are excited and are, you know, I guess, welcoming to these ideas. What happens if you're in a place where you believe this stuff personally, but your leadership is not supportive of this kind of an approach? That's the majority. <laughs> <laughs> believe me, it's not that easy. Well, you know, ideas, most ideas in business don't don't resonate on the value. They resonate how well they're sold. Uh, it's, it's really, you have to learn how to sell an idea, how to give evidence, how to give data, how to tell stories about it, get cases. It's really a sales job as much as it is the truth. Uh, you know, you may believe in it. So you just have to learn how to present this okay. happened in this way. One of the first knowledge projects I ever worked was at the World Bank. And a fellow named Steve Denning and I were working together. And he, uh, he used a story about how um, these World Bank employees did some wonderful work in Peru, and he told it as a story rather than PowerPoint, and everyone nodded their head. And so he said that was a knowledge transfer in Peru. I won't go into the details; it's not necessary. And from there, we began to move slowly but surely. I said, remember when I was working at Ernst and Young with Tom Davenport, and one of the senior people says, "If you keep talking about knowledge, we're going to fire you." He said, "What do you mean?" He says, "We can't make money on it." So, anyway, now knowledge is now works in the boardroom. You can go to any boardroom and talk about knowledge and you won't get thrown out. That was a tremendous achievement in the 20 years, believe me. But it's true. You won't get thrown out. People will listen. Let's talk about what your organization knows. How do they use what they know? How do they gain new knowledge? It all works now, but it didn't, didn't it, back then. It's also a different time. I realized I talked about 2000. I got to NASA in the 80s and it was just a slower place. One of the things I used to ask the leaders is how much change Laverne, you're, you're, you know, how much change do you expect? And literally, most of them would say 10%. Wow. Some of them would say 20%. I mean, you, that's it's a totally amazing. different world. Yeah, to so you fast funny. forward it today, speed, things are happening, right? Uh, things are always going on. And so you don't have time to really not know what's going on. You don't have time to know your expertise. Sure. Uh, that whole issue is really more and more important. My bias though, is if you're in a heavily project-based organization that's mission-based, then those folks get it because a project is a sporting event. You know the score, you see how you're doing. You can choose not to say, but you can see it. And it's based around what's the quality of what we're doing, what's the time frame, what's the cost, and it's the collaboration that's taking place. Project folks, the engineers at NASA were really smart. They figured it out. Now, sometimes they would tell me we're not going to say, you know, up what's happening, but they saw it. But uh, to me, I, I typically worked in organizations that are very motivated, very driven. Success is really vital. 
And uh, so I think if, if there's a sense of, if you get them to talk about what it takes to be successful, uh, so when you talk they, about I think speed. they get that. Yeah, when you talk about speed of change, uh, I see Ben Royce in the audience. Um, um, I, think about, um, I think about AI right away. And I think about, you know, how is that gonna start to impact how projects are done, how fast they change? What are your thoughts around like, you know, um, what kind of impact is that gonna have on the project world? I mean, I think project folks are used to using tools. Okay. Uh, they're using technologies. So I think it always, impact. I think it makes things, there's a demand from customers to do it faster. You committed to this, we changed our mind, we want it done quicker. Uh, there's technology. Um, I was talking, I was being driven someplace to get here by the driver. And I started getting all these texts from uh, colleagues from PMI, can you do this and all that? And I remember, and I, I remember saying, I'm sorry, because I stopped talking to her. It used to be if I was traveling someplace, then you wouldn't get stopped. But nowadays we have these phones and we can look at it. We see what's going on. We get all this data. And then the question is, how do we use it? Mm -hmm. And so I think it's going to speed things up, but I think it, it puts more pressure on the ability to collaborate, to communicate, and to figure out how do we work successfully as humans. So human machines, I think, blend together. And those who are good at it will succeed and flourish. And those who don't will, uh, will not. Generally, machines don't feel passion. I mean, maybe they will one day. I don't know. I'm <laughs> sure I won't be around by then. But generally, you really want to have passion about the mission. You really want to do this well. And you can program a machine as best you can. And it'll be wonderful. You'll see all sorts of amazing things. But there are cre inductive jumps that occur when people have new ideas. Maybe these new AI systems that I've been reading about all the time can do that but it'll never be the same. The human brain is the most complex thing on earth. It really is. And if it can be replicated, fine. Some of you may live long enough to see that, but I doubt it. Interesting. Okay. Um, what was your favorite part of the book to write? What was what? Summary count. Favorite part of the book. What was your favorite part of the book to write? <laughs> the, I would say in my case, the chapter on knowledge, the chapter on stories, and the chapter on culture. Okay. Yeah, that's good. I, I, to me, the whole thing was kind of, I mean, it's weird. It was kind of like a wonderful experience because of Matt and Larry. Um, I think what happens, if I'm really in this at this moment, what I like about this is it's social. I can see people, you can, in, you can laugh, you can, you can move forward, all right? And writing in the past was very individualistic. And when I'm too locked in, I get kind of cranky and all that kind of stuff. But I'm talking every week with Larry, which is delightful. And I'm talking to Matt, and we're coming up with things we never thought about. And you're and so to me, the whole thing was uh, was was wonderful. The, the the piece that I was interested in was on the team chapter. Mm -hmm. One of the models I always hated that I had to teach at NASA was the the Tuckman model, that teams go through phases, you know, norming, storming, and I always hated when people because it, it was good in its time in the '60s, but it, no, it the notion to me was always you take time to work as a team, and you're going to go through this, then you're going to go through that. It's kind of predictive. One of the things I love about the Agile movement is that to do Agile, you have to put a lot of emphasis on collaboration and teams. You build trust sure. and that allows you to go faster. And so to me, when I was writing that and seeing things at NASA and other organizations, it was a recognition that we are evolving. Uh, we now value the point of teams. We understand the importance of people because if you don't have that trust, if you don't have the collaboration, then uh, the data doesn't get used. We, wrote a nice we have a nice chapter in that book on collaboration yeah. written by another colleague, colleague of ours, Don Cohen, who right. also was a writer at NASA when we were there. And it's about the space station, which was done by the US and Russia, countries that generally didn't collaborate too much, but they made it work. And 21 other, I mean, for That's right, 20, 21 yeah. countries were in this. I always felt they should have gotten a Nobel Prize. Yeah, a peace uh, prize. Not only for the engineering, been. but we basically have had humans living in space Right, for years, 20 years. Years. years, and it took 21 different countries from the European uh, uh, nations, from Japan, uh, from uh, all over to work together. They had to switch at the midpoint when the USSR, the wall came down and we were directed uh, to work with Russia. And think about it, you've built half a house and now you all have, <laughs> yeah, and, and now you, you have to redevelop the project uh, connections. But it was the part, it was beautifully done. It was yeah. uh, one of the things I was always so uh, inspired by. And so the last chapter was this, this story. Unfortunately, when you talk to a lot of folks about global collaboration, unfortunately nowadays it's 
it's harder yeah, for sure. than it was 10 years ago. But uh, yeah, that was an interesting one. Yeah, it's a lot of, I mean, it's true, global politics really starts to influence global collab, which is a terrible shame. Well, the human, again, I mean, the human. Yeah, human to like that, but we try vital. to try to, I mean, look at the COVID situation. If, if people, all the countries collaborated, we would have done, made great pro progress, but they didn't. There'll be some interesting books written on this uh, in the very near future, but you do the best you can. Right. If um, one reads your book and you want them to come away with just one idea, what would you want that one? You know, oh, for me, it's take easy. It My students would probably be able to say it. To me, the most important thing is people. The second most important thing is people. The third most important thing is people. I worked at NASA. Page, so, yeah. I had to work at NASA You know, for so many. The, the early years, I was quiet uh, because I didn't want them to really know too much I was a psychologist. But then I started finding out people coming, logic folks, engineers, scientists. And what they would say is the hard part is the people. Mm -hmm. And Golden, I mean, Golden was, you know, and he was screaming, and he, but he was right. I mean, I remember when I was getting yelled at in the plane, I'm getting yelled at by an engineer who's a senior executive who's telling me the job I should know about teams and people. Uh, so to me, the most important thing uh, is uh, pay attention to the people. They'll tell you the truth. You have people in a project who come from hundreds of different disciplines. Someone has the answer if they're comfortable to to say it so you really but you have to nur nurse that it doesn't happen right. naturally i would i would add to that i mean of course i would agree with that but i think the role of intangibles in any organization right. that's what i would emphasize i've read recently that maybe 60 to 70 percent of an organization's success is based on intangibles like culture like learning like knowledge like so all the things we wrote about and wall street's catching on to this you're beginning to see an interest in wall street on the quality of management on do they learn things it's beginning slowly beginning to perk up because they can't measure it's hard to measure some of these things but a lot of people are working on that so i think I mean, people used to say to me what do you mean intangibles i said do you love your children what's the roi on children what about <laughs> what about you what about maybe too difficult for yeah well that's not an easy one you're right <laughs> about that but what about the roi you know about patriotism piety working for a cause like climate change trust trust, right? trust. Yeah. exactly which is what alex is doing I mean, all these things are intangible, and yet it makes the world go round. It makes our gives our life meaning. And so, it's more important because one of the books we were influenced by was by uh, John Kay and uh, I think Mervyn uh, King, yeah. uh, who wrote a book, Radical Uncertainty. Yeah. Their basic premise, and again, this goes back to projects and economics, is they say that the economists kind of got it wrong. About 100 years ago, there was a significant difference between a risk and uncertainty, right? <laughs> And we were talking about that in the, the, the PMI book club, but risk is the notion that you can predict it. You can put down probabilities and you kind of have a sense of what the outcome is. And you kind of know what the problem is and you know what success looks like. Uncertainty, really, you don't have those numbers. And so in an environment, how do you prepare for something you really can't anticipate? What a good project person would, would, would know is you, you figure out what are the key possibilities and then you prepare capability prioritized based on that you can't do everything and uh you know we went from at least I, I worked from a period and you did too where some people would pull up make believe numbers oh yeah and they didn't really tell anything uh and they certainly weren't good for probability right? well yeah exactly. and in the world of speed and new technologies and AI and where are we going and new you know where do you predict viruses you just don't know you may know what's happening so you can you can prepare and you can build capabilities. But it, again, it comes down to talent. And ideally you have somebody on the team that says, I think we need to focus on this. I think we need to adjust that. This isn't working. And the ability to change. Sure. One of the challenges in any organization, NASA was very successful, but you had people who kept doing things successfully for 10 years, 20 years. And now you're saying you got to do something different. Right. And my generation always, I think, had more of a problem with that. So anytime a new leader would come on board, a large part of their effort is how do I get change? I don't want to hurt you. I don't want to change. But how do we do things differently? And there's often a battle around that. And so I think uh, nowadays it's the ability to be more adaptive and responsive. And there's always black swans. If you ever want to read an interesting book about that, read Nasa Talib's book, The Black Swan. Yeah, there's always black swans. There always will be black swans. And he's right. Having the capability of adjusting, having the capability of quickly responding to a black swan, an incident that no one could have predicted, of which we could all name quite a few of them, COVID being an example, and the great leap in AI that we're witnessing. Uh, that's less of a black swan, but it's certainly 
is very influential. You need the capabilities. You need that's one of the things in this book we're trying. You need to have the capability. You have to have not just the right people, which is very important, but give them the tools, have them there so they can work together quickly to react to a very complex world. Uh, the knowledge got democratized. So every country can do almost everything. Any person who's literate can find out almost all the information they ever need. This is a new thing in world history. It's never happened before that so many people, the whole anyone in the world who's literate, they know English in particular, but even, even so, they don't. There's enough machine translation can do almost anything. So the monopoly on knowledge that was held by Western Europe, the United States, Japan, broken. There's no more monopoly on useful knowledge. I don't mean aesthetic knowledge or philosophical knowledge, but the knowledge that allows you to build a rocket, for example. That's a tremendous change in world history. Would you say that that you need to start with all the preconditions for a smart mission, or can you take a mission that is sort of in, in limbo and having problems and kind of yeah, spin we, it the right yeah, way? We have an example, uh, I guess we could say it's stereo. Uh, I was working at NASA, I got a call from the deputy administrator. Again, usually, whenever a senior leader calls, it's not, they want to say, hi, how are you doing? Never, never ever that. News. It's never good news. No, uh, and in this case, it wasn't a problem for me, but Stereo was a very, is a very successful, selected as a project of the year, number of years. But at the time, it was in a, in a failure direction, way over cost, schedule is bad. And everyone knew uh, that there were interpersonal battles between the two lead centers and the international, and it was, it was not going well. And one of the only times this ever happened, I had a senior leader. Chris Scalise was the deputy administrator at NASA, and uh, he was, um, he basically said, look, I want you to do one of those team things that, yeah, this is pretty much how it's pretty much done. And uh, I said, oh, you want us to work with the stereo team in terms of, it says, you know, everything we do at NASA is voluntary. It's up to the project lead and the team that I don't care if it's up to them. You go in there. And so, so we went and the data we initially collected from interviews and from a short eight question survey was at the time, some of the worst data I'd ever seen with the team. Uh, they didn't like each other. They didn't trust each other. They, I mean, it was it was ugly. We talked about how do we try. I said, we'll just show it to them. If they don't like it, this training is going to end. We'll have three free days if you know if they want to do something. Really, and so we presented it just on a screen where they can see the comments that the team members had made. And but not who said it. And it was quiet. And finally, uh, I think the systems person from JPL said, "That's us," and it's an embarrassment. Mm -hmm. And thankfully, the second one who said, it, I think, it was the project. You know, person from the other center and says that is us and it is an embarrassment mm -hmm. you know it's an embarrassment to our country to nasa to our international partners and at that moment immediately it was really amazing to me it was one of those moments of pride they said we're going to change this what they did was they changed totally the narrative but it was all around how they collaborated with each other they, they spent time talking about what's the new story of how they're going to work together uh they talked about the roles and responsibilities they're applying and uh, they committed to assessing themselves, I think every three months. And um, I think there are a variety of reasons, but so I, I totally believe uh, you can get to a point where things are not going well and you can take it time. But part of it is also knowledge is different than learning. So I've seen teams and I've seen one of the dangers of a successful place like NASA is you can believe that. There's a thing called NASA arrogance, which is, hey, we've been to the moon, you haven't. And it's really powerful. <laughs> And so, you, so the danger there is you believe your knowledge is always going to be there. You're always going to be the best. And uh, in a world of change and uh, with all the things going on, if you stop learning, if you don't support it, if you're, not, if you're not willing to change, then slowly it starts going in the wrong directions. And so learning is related to knowledge, but it's very different. And uh, it's really vital. One of the things I was really proud of working at NASA is that it was always a learning environment. It was painful, but I mean, people will, would yell at you at things if it wasn't going right, but they were committed. I had a budget for, I was there 33 years. I think I only had one budget cut in the time I was running the NASA Academy. Just about every year, the budget was increasing. Uh, we ended up having a budget about $50 million for the engineering and project community. They took it seriously. I mean, had the director, the administrator, Dan Golden, he was very controversial, but I, I loved working for him. He, uh, he would... He would smack me around, but I grew up in Brooklyn. That wasn't that unusual to it. But I remember one day he, he went to the head of HR. He said, we don't do anything around stories. Now, where's he going to go with this? He said, the best organizations, they have stories. They share it. We know what's going on. We don't do any of that stuff with our project folks. So there's this sense of learning that you're not, it's not good enough where you are. 
where are you going? And uh, so I think that learning piece is really vital. You could view knowledge and learning as two sides of the same coin. Right. What you learn is knowledge, becomes your knowledge. I mean, yeah. if you think about it that way, you, you just add to your knowledge when you learn something. But they have different processes. They, they work a little differently as processes. I mean, groups learn and groups gain the knowledge, not so much individuals. I don't, Ed and I do not believe much in individualism in this case. That I've said this many times. Knowledge is a profoundly social phenomena. Yeah. It doesn't matter what an individual know, knows. We all want to be knowledgeable. We like talking. It's really what a group knows, whatever the size of the group. It's a social activity if they agree that this is knowledge. Knowledge is a different thing than truth, by the way. <laughs> it's what people assume is right. It's assume it's knowledge. But you know, we could all be proven wrong. But again, it's a not, it's a project, really. Yeah. I mean, and again, I grew up at NASA, which only knew projects. And uh, our folks, I used to say, and I always believed that from the time I was young, give me 20 NASA people and we can do anything for good or evil in the world. So you, you want to be directed with the right values, but literally, because they and they for a short period of time, we won't go into the story, I owned a racehorse. And there was a mistake. But I literally, I went to the NASA group I was working with. I said, how many of you know no resources? And out of uh, 20 people, there were three people who had owned racehorses. There was someone else. I mean, you know, they started coming up with answers. But if you get a group of people uh, who are interested in stuff, humans figure things out uh, in, in aggregate. It's an amazing thing. Yeah. When you're talking about the social side of things, Larry, like now with everybody... Uh, split apart, you know, with with uh, online work and Zoom and whatnot. How do you recreate that kind of physical social space? How do you how do you make those inroads and and make those connections? It's going to be much harder. There's no question. You can, people try to create electronic water coolers, you know, where people would gather together and talk, and it it's not been that successful. I, I noticed a number of CEOs recently, Jamie Demon at uh, Chase, and there's quite a few others. I didn't do research on this to come to you, but they were all quite few. You're saying you have to be in the office at least three days a week. And I would do that. If I ran a company, I would do that too. About two days. Two, two days. Well, you yeah, know, no, we can okay. bargain about it. Yeah. We can bargain. But it really, you can't build a relationship very well without knowing a person, talking to people. It doesn't work that well, just Zooming. I mean, I like Zoom. We all use it. I'm very happy to use it, but you should really meet now and then. You really need to do that. And that there's no substitute for that. There's no substitute for being there. You ever see that movie with Peter Sellers being there? There's no, there's no substitute for that. So I think no matter what people do, they're still going to need people. They're still going to create relationships. Trust yeah. is a big one here. You don't really trust people that well until you really get to know them and talk with them and see what they're doing. And people can put on great acts on Zoom, but you really meet them and see... You know, a lot of what Edward Hall wrote that book, The Hidden Dimension, about how much of communications is hidden. It's not the words. It's a lot of other things that go into communication. And I think that's true. So I think I, I'm on the side of those CEOs who say you have to come into the office. Now, when they, not every day, and there's obviously exceptions, but I would do it. I would make them come in. Unwritten rule, at least at NASA, that I grew up kind of believing is that if you're working, 90% of the projects are international collaborations through industry, 90% industry. And what the project folks uh, would used to say is make sure you have enough travel money so that at least every six months you're getting together. Right. And the meetings weren't important. The food and the drink was important. The point is to socialize. Yeah. And, to, yeah. and um, to, just so there was trust. And then the other months you can work at a distance. Uh, but if you're apart too far, uh, then it goes. And that's, a, you know. There's a one Probably, can, but there's a, sorry, okay. they, would, they, they had one of the biggest travel budgets. Oh yeah, they, because they bought for that. Point. That was essential. Yeah, I mean the knowledge team. I, you know, I wanted to make sure we'd always get together. So it's, yeah. it's very important. You know, there was a famous study done oh, quite a few years ago when people still smoked, and you know, some people smoked, most didn't, at least in the U.S. So the people who smoked would leave and stand by the door, you know, yeah. outside, and it would take all sorts of people, from senior executives to the mailroom. And it turned out that the people who low down on the organization rose because they heard news from the senior people who they never met. That's right. They hang around, they're smoking and they're chatting, and they sort of become more dem democratically inclined because they're all smokers. Now, I think there's, there's other examples of this we could give, sure. but there's no substitute for the human angle in these things. All right. I think that we're going to start to uh, oh, yeah. uh, 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 Q&A section, if that's right with everyone. So I think we have uh, I don't, uh, uh, microphones to hand out and uh, 
if you have any questions, just, I guess, raise your hand and, and someone will bring a microphone over to you. Any questions in the audience? Come on, they're nice guys. They're not scary. I don't think they're scared. <laughs> Can I ask you a question if they don't ask? Oh, you? sure. Okay. You're, you're doing climate stuff. Yeah, I'm trying to build that it. kind of stuff in, in the current environment. Yeah, I mean it's interesting. I mean it's been so so um, so politicized, um, really, that we're trying to stay on the e side of the coin and just talk yeah. about how that I think everyone can agree that everyone wants clean water. I think that's an easy sell, and so always a good thing. And you're know, having a stock exchange that that focuses people on and and, and focuses companies on the um, how to say it, credibly committed right. is you know. Is important and as all the future needs. So. And what you're doing, one of the things that, that, that impresses me, and again, you're uh, one of the students that are brilliant that I don't totally know uh, what you're doing, but it's the use of technology, predictive models, and, and data as a way of anticipating what are the technologies that will be economically beneficial that people can use. So again, it's that link of technology with, with the human element. I see a question. Yeah. Hi, yeah. Um, so um, we're learning a lot about obviously just having a, a common language between teams and, and between um, groups in an organization, right? Not necessarily just uh, a language as in English or Spanish or whatnot, but just speaking the same terms and, and having like that same, um, I think, almost mission ingrained. Um, and then we're also learning a lot about business analytics, right? And how um, analytics and, and really having that business analytical mentality can um, um, ultimately get lost as well um, if different teams aren't necessarily speaking that same language as well. So I'm wondering um, what your perspectives are on um, the importance that language, ha speaking that common language has also in um, just like a, an effectively run knowledge um, organization and knowledge management program within a, an organization. You want to end? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, again, I mean, projects are global, they're international. So you have the different languages, but you also, um, you, you, the same words mean slightly different things by different partners because of standards and policies. I don't think I don't think there has to be a common language, meaning that we speak a common language, but I think there has to be an understanding of what are we trying to do, and there needs to be enough conversations. I'll give you a quick example. One of the uh, forums I had was with, between leaders of the European Space Agency and NASA. And um, I'd asked a question about how both parties did systems engineering. And the ESA person explained it. And during the meeting, he was so excited. The NASA guy said, you know, we never understood. We never saw how you did systems engineering in your projects. You were good, but we were always skeptical because we didn't see it. Now I realize you do it kind of the way we do it, but you use a different language and different sequencing. And they were both giddy over the fact that, oh, yeah, now we. So when people, I think, talk, they can use different terms. They have different cultural approaches, but they have an understanding that the things that are vital to be successful are happening and having that kind of communication. So again, I'm a believer, as you know, is you gotta have enough conversation time. So uh, this is what we're doing. This is what we're trying to get. And you can call it different things, but you get there, uh, I think appropriately. Time to talk is really essential. We should give them time to talk. Yeah. <laughs> Tell me to shut up, Larry. No, what? no. <laughs> no, no, I did not. <laughs> Uh, hello, Larry and, and Adam. Really nice to uh, see you in person again. Um, you mentioned um, the importance of AI coming in into our lives and the transition we're in. And also, uh, we have been waiting for so long, knowing from your teachings, um, that knowledge management has been waiting for decades to be finally noticed. Um, and you're seeing it coming into the to the boardrooms at the moment. What do you think will happen in the future? Which one will we will win with AI or knowledge management, or can we combine the two? It, it'll get combined. Yeah. It's a very it's a very useful tool. You could do all sorts of things with it. You'd be any. I think Bertrand Russell said this. That anything that's really developed and useful is always used. He, he was talking about nuclear weapons, which is pretty pretty ugly. But on the other hand, it's true. It, the, the genie's out of the bottle. So I'm positive that, but it'll also, AI will also, I think, I could, you know, this is just talking, I think will actually place a greater focus on what it can't do and what humans can do. 
At least I, I think they go to, I mean, technology and people go together. Yeah. We only get a problem when we ignore them. And uh, one of the things, uh, fear uh, is in the room. One of the things, when you get asked questions, one of the things I've heard you say is that basically organizations are about knowledge, expertise, know-how, getting the answers, finding it fast, and relationships or connections. And fundamentally, I think that's about technology and human smarts, as well as with the relationship to work effectively together and communicate effectively. And again, fundamentally, I think that's what successful projects are about. And uh, successful companies are about that. Those are the yeah. two pillars is relationship and knowledge. Yeah. The products of knowledge are the stuff that our friend Ben here works on his company, but relationships are a little different. You can't buy them, you can't design them, you have to work at them. But those are the two major pillars and that's what we try to talk about. Yeah. We both it's spoke. possible that AI may, may, may cover relationships because I'm totally not sure if this is really Ben Royce. <laughs> Or if this is a bot simulation yeah, that Ben has created, and uh, it's like yeah. a look of sorts. It's yeah. like, it looks okay. like him, but hey. yeah, you never know. Yeah. What's your favorite dessert? <laughs> yeah, deep <laughs> face. All right, it's Ben. Yeah. Curious about your um, definition of knowledge. You, you mentioned earlier that it's an aggregate of people kind of having information and bringing it all together. In keeping with the topic of AI, you you have these machines now that have volumes and volumes of data. Do you cons are you able, from your opinion, to equate that to knowledge now that they're able to contextualize this data and answer abstract questions that before wasn't able to do? No, I how is that different from how you would define knowledge? Knowledge is experiential. You gain knowledge by doing things. You want to be a chemist, you can get a degree in chemistry and read everything about chemistry. But until you do chemistry, you're not really a chemist. And I think that's true with project management, anything. It's experiential. Now, it's true, who knows what AI directions it's going to go in. I'm not going to talk about that. But experience is the basis of most knowledge. You can absorb a lot of information. You can absorb a lot of data. I know people, you know, I live in very near Cambridge, Massachusetts, where a lot of people have a lot of information. They like they like talking about it, but sometimes they don't have as much experience. And also you want wisdom. And wisdom is not something you can get from a machine. It's judgment, judgment and empathy. And it's going to be a long time before you see that coming out of a machine. Again, again NASA is, a, you know, it's an engineering, it's a tech firm, right? Science. The best project managers and systems engineers uh, were highly relational. They were smarter in terms of their networks of who to go to uh, and their use of stories than they were in terms of having the answers. And the ones who had the biggest problems, uh, they felt they had all the answers. They may have, but uh, people didn't want to work with them. Uh, there, there's a human, at this point in time, there's a human connection that we want to see when we're working on things. And we use the technology and the data to augment that and build that to reinforce it. And uh, unfortunately, I, I saw many careers that have, brilliant people, really good people, but they they valued their their discipline smarts and they didn't value their relationship skills. And uh, I, it, you wouldn't get selected if you don't have strong relationship skills. Uh, no administrator wants to get a call from an international partner or the head of Boeing or something upset about something having to do with one of your, so they just, they'll, they'll mitigate that risk by selecting for the relationship along with people who are smart as opposed to someone who's brilliant, but you worry about when you're not in the room with. Guarantee that one. Hi, Hi my Jeff. name is Jeff, ICANS 2015. Congratulations on your book, friends. Thank you. Thank I'm you. very much looking forward to reading it. Um, so I'm a cultural sociologist. I think a lot about culture and I think a lot about narratives and stories. And for me, uh, ICANS, was very much a people management degree, um, uh, almost exclusively in my mind and how I put it to work in my, at, at my job. Uh, anyways, my question about narratives and story and people, um, can you talk a little bit about where those narratives, the mechanism by which those narratives become culture at, at an organization? <laughs> that's, a, that's a good question. I mean, I got a lot of those ideas from Clifford Gertz to give you an idea, that's it was very influential. Culture but, is a story we tell ourselves about ourselves. Exactly. That's a, that's a hard question to answer. I would say, if I had to just someone put a gun to my head and say, answer this question, is that 
One, a lot of those narratives and stories come from leaders. People look up to, you know, it's a hierarchical thing. And that's why I think uh, I've heard many people say that the chief, one of the great attributes of a good leader is telling a good narrative, telling a story that really inspires the mission, inspires the company. I think that's true. You know, if you look at the last 20 year history of Microsoft, you could see this happening. It's very interesting. Uh, and it circulates. Stories stick if they make sense. Stories stick if they have some value to you. I mean, if someone tells you some story that's just pointless or nothing could do with it, they really won't have much sympathy. You tell someone a story that's interesting, that has some value, it circulates. It's like a market. There's a market for stories in organizations. James March wrote that, uh, something like that. There's a market for stories and the better ones went out and the lesser ones sort of dot, fade away. But certainly, uh, it's a real role for senior people to tell a narrative. For people to respond to it, I, I was working, and again, NASA, you think about it as a tech organization. I remember one of the most successful senior project managers told me one day, he said, you're great with the story. Now get the data. I said, well, he said, you got the story down. Find the data, even make up the data. He said, uh, the, the, the story will drive people. People want to believe the story. But at NASA, they get comfortable with some of the numbers that support it. So a little bit of a skeptical, but, and one of the things I heard others saying, yeah, what you want to do when you go to one of those briefings, you have the story because that will appeal to everyone in the room. And then you, you have enough data that just buries any, any potential opposition. And again, that's partly how I was, uh, was trained. If you don't have both in a place like that, uh, you're, if you don't have data that reinforces things, uh, you're not going to get it. But if you don't have the story, and if you don't have a driving sense of the narrative, uh, the numbers by itself won't take you there. It creates meaning, those stories. Yeah. The knowledge creates meaning to have information and data. It's a simple statement, but it's true. It creates the meaning of it rather than, oh, sorry. That's okay. Hang on, we'll get your microphone. One second. Oh. Hi. Sorry, good. Yeah. Oh, no, it's okay. I think we'll do that first. We'll come right to you. We'll come so, to you, Judy. Yeah, we'll come back. I don't think it's a question anymore of the value that organizations attribute to knowledge and that, you know, Larry, you spoke to the uh, the kind of intangible of knowledge that it's not always something that's classically trained. Um, how do we get organizations, <clears throat> excuse me, to understand and bring in those people who have a narrative to tell and knowledge to contribute uh, that don't fit this traditional mold of almost a pre-recognition uh, of, you know, the value that diverse thought and opinion bring to an organization where do you need this I'm doing degree? a little do uh, this, consulting that? these days with a large NGO. And that's sort of an issue that the woman who's hired me has. Write some cases and distribute them. Say, this is what, when we use knowledge in this situation, this is the result. Just, you know, write cases. Cases are just stories but they have data behind them. They have truth behind them. It's, they really happen. That's what I would recommend. I recommended that to her too. Start, start getting cases, tell stories about how knowledge works in an organization. You're right, a lot of people don't, you don't have to be classically trained, <laughs> believe me. It just, I remember hearing years and years ago, there was a faint, you know, if you got the right information to the right person at the right time, you'd enter Nirvana, you'd enter the promised land. I somehow knew that couldn't be true, but I couldn't prove it. And luckily, I got a job in Ernst & Young running their research unit with Tom Davenport. And we both remember Peter Drucker telling us, it's knowledge that matters. And that boom, light went off. Yes, it's knowledge, that judgment and wisdom. Oh, wait, didn't you? Did yeah. you Are you sure? Okay. Hello, um, my name is John. Um, my question is um, how I see IKNS is like a competitive advantage for companies. Um, it's like uh, something that you can use to exploit the market. So um, e exploit and speed up everything, the, the results of the, the business. So if everyone applies like AI collabor collaboration and knowledge, that means it's the same normal back again. So what do you think is next? First of all, don't worry about it. Uh, <laughs> you're never going to get, I, I mean, uh, an Ed kind of theory is that in leadership, in life, in sports, uh, there are always people who see it, they learn, they adapt, they change, uh, they're committed to it, and they keep improving. And they're often competing against those who don't take that stuff as seriously. 
And to be honest with you, I think about 70 to 80% of the organizations that I've been around don't, uh, you know, they, they don't seem to get that kind of an energy. So if you're really doing a lot of things effectively on learning, uh, on knowledge, uh, then you'll, you'll stay at least in the top 20% for a long time. I, I mean, that maybe is a skeptical kind of a thing, no, but no, I, agree with that. I, I, you know, you, you can see organizations, I can see in teams, I can see leaders who, um, they're, they're at a, such a different state. Uh, they want to continue doing things the way they've been doing it. Look at the maybe history. Miss, yeah. Look at the history of General Electric in the last 50 years. You know, it was one of the great companies, iconic company in the United States. And then they had a CEO who only cared about money. He cared about, you know, return for shareholders and he ruined the company. I mean, maybe they'll come back. I hope so, but it ruined it. You have to really focus on learning and knowledge. You can't not do it. There was so much technology, so many ideas, so much stuff going on. You know how many papers are written every day from all around the world that are technologically interesting and maybe useful? I mean, eventually you'll have AI can look through this for you, but there's a tremendous amount of data and information being published. And if you ignore that, down you go. It's too easy also to become complacent. Um, left NASA about 33 years. Part of the things I remember at the beginning of my career that it kind of I didn't like, I saw senior leaders and people would tell, talk to about them in their past tense. This person was great 10 years ago. And, this, and uh, I, you know, I think it's good to go and be challenged, but it's very seductive to, I've been really successful. Things are going great. We don't need to change. <laughs> Who's that person trying to change things? Right. And a lot of organizations, a lot of societies get locked into that. If you're not on the edge of learning, challenging, uh, being comfortable with the recognizing failure, listening to people who are annoying because they're taking you to new directions, then slowly you're, you're, you're walking away from it. And uh, so. That's why reading history is a useful subject. Read some of the histories of these countries and organizations and see what happened to them. There's a good book about General Electric. It's called Lights Out. <laughs> it's a very, very well written book. And that's that's just one of the Microsoft almost died because of that. Now they bounce back. And very good Great leadership. leadership. Great leadership, absolutely. But you, you just read the business press, you'll see, you know, ups and downs. And often it's going the wrong path. That was encouraged by the economist, by the way. He said stakeholder value is all that matters, which is just not true. <laughs> well, it's hard to again bias. I don't care, but I think if you look at companies, places that invest heavily in learning, uh, they have to believe in that because it's hard to immediately see, you know, they see it, it's costing. And uh, again, uh, it's uh, it's not, not, not typical. Judy. Hi there. And uh, as I posted on your LinkedIn site the other day, great authors, great book. And really, we mean that. And Laverne Johnson, the president and CEO of IIL. Uh, has really believed in this book since the moment you told us about it. So you're on the cover, or what's well, not the cover? You're you're in the back of it. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, um, some of us in this room, probably not that many, remember witnessing the Challenger disaster. Yeah. I mean, it was it was a traumatic event for us, the way the assassination of a president was, and of the same level. How would the principles of SMART mission, how could the principles of SMART mission have made a difference? Not to put you on the spot. Or oh, anything. huge, huge. Okay. I mean, that's one of the impact. I mean, read the case studies. Yeah. Uh, it's an embarrassment when the first time some of the students that I had, when we used to use that as a case, they read it. They uh, they looked at NASA in a very different way. I mean, look at what, some of the things that are going on. The, the, the engineers who are basically saying we have a problem here were sometimes told, uh, we don't have a problem. Stop talking about it. Uh, the head of safety uh, was told uh, we've looked into things. They hadn't. Uh, they don't need to. There was a lack of collecting data. Uh, there was a lack of reaching out for help in other parts of the organization. But but fundamentally, there was an increase in silence as to some of the things that were taking place. And uh, and uh, again, from the standpoint of the book, I guess the short message is is uh, you have to value your people. You have to have an environment that's open to learning. Learning means that you're going to hear things you don't want to hear. Uh, knowledge is dynamic, uh, so don't get comfortable. You have to have fundamentally a culture that values all people. And you never tell people uh, you don't want to hear what they have to say. And uh, all those things were were violated. Uh, and uh, it 
Yeah. It, it led to that. This, by the, way. the Challenge of Disaster by Diane Vaughan. Yeah, brilliant book. Brilliant book. Brilliant book. Really, really. And it's just what Ed said. It, it covers yeah. it, but very well-written, important she, book. She termed that years. notion of normalization of deviance. Actually, she's a professor here at Columbia. Um, but the whole notion of normalization of deviance is that it's it's not usually evil that leads to these issues. It's the fact that things were not done the way they were supposed to done. Uh, to be done by the standards that had been set. But because it didn't lead to a failure, they started accepting that deviation and it became normalized. And so again, it becomes the norm and eventually it, it leads to uh, to this failure. I mean, we had known about some of the issues they were raised, they were in the reports, we need to look at this, this can lead to a problem. But because it immediately didn't lead to a failure, uh, the deviation of normalization, I think, inherently comes um, from not having a psychologically safe environment where people can say it, and yeah, we need to look at this, and uh, and then you get to the point of, well, maybe they won't, maybe it won't fail, uh, and that's not the way you want to be writing it. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, I have a question about AI. It seems to be getting stronger and stronger and more prominent. When do you get to be to trust it that it's giving you the right information? Currently, there's something called Chat GPT, and it, you can ask all sorts of questions, and it looks reasonable. And if you ask a mathematical question like how much is 100 plus 300, it gives you the right answer. But if you ask it how much is 3.7 raised to the 4.7 power, it gives you the wrong answer. So Bob, I'm going to ask you to give the microphone to uh, <laughs> no pressure, to ben. ben. No pressure. Answer the question. No ben. pressure. Wow. Um, wow. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think I have to know. So I'll be really quick because this is your show. Um, there's a concept called hallucination, not drugs, not related to that. Uh, it's where you consume so much text as a machine that you essentially can get confused because context is lost. So, for example, if you read two articles on Wikipedia, one about Robert F. Kennedy, one about John F. Kennedy, both of them will refer to them as Kennedy. This is easily confused when you read thousands of them, right? Uh, and this is why you have this mistake, right? Mathematical stuff is mathematical. Like this, to the power of is just not equated exactly the way you think. That's a minor, easily fixable problem. But um, there should always be skepticism. I test this stuff a lot. I've seen a lot of people test it. It's never going to be perfect. Sure, humans aren't perfect either. Um, but it is a problem where we're learning how to handle large amounts of text that are written in different contexts and then put it into your context, which is a third one. So it's um, a known problem. It's called hallucination. Um, and it's called hallucination because it's partly based in reality, but it's definitely not real, which is a weird, weird kind of place to be. So that's my short answer. Hallucination. I thought that was a rock group from the 60s. It's, 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 Maybe it was. <laughs> it definitely can be too. But again, I mean, this is what we're talking about. I mean, what am I going to say about AI? What are you going to? But again, the knowledge is at the aggregate, and so you know, this is what Ben looks at in terms of Google. And uh, so, when you have a community, uh, somebody will have the answer in, in addressing these things. Hi, um, my name is Clementina, and thank you so much for all this information tonight. Very, um, very helpful. I wanted to know, going back to culture and bringing people in and how much is the electronic cooler really working there's resistance to that now because post covid people think they can do their job from home and they can do it well where is that motivation and i think in it just from your opinion and your expertise um what tools will be helpful to sort of embrace the new culture flow with the you know with the change that's um taken over society and still motivate people where you're not forcing them to come in or forcing them to have that natural um, exchange and natural um, trust building relationship building, but so it can be more natural and you can really show them the importance of knowledge and how, you know, we need to be in the room together. Well, I, I, I don't agree with that. I don't think it can. I mean, if you really want to absorb a culture of an organization, you really have to be there. Look at the way people dress, the way they talk, the way they act. You, you absorb it. Osmo, it says osmotic. It's like osmosis. You absorb it. Looking at your screen is not the answer to that. Well, I think 
there's a balance. I mean, I think, well, I, I like working from home now. <laughs> well, yeah. Let, let me make a, I mean, I think you can, you balance yeah. these things. And so I, I, innovation is going down. Why is innovation going down? Because humans aren't coming together and connecting and all that kind of stuff. I think that's true. But, you know, there's a balancing point. Um, you know, I think a lot of people can work most of the time from home. And when do you need to talk to people and how do you do that? When do you come together? You and I, you know, we didn't see each other during the whole COVID period. I know. But we knew, we, we knew each other. Yeah. We yeah. trusted each other. Yeah. We know each other we quite well. We together from a distance. Exactly yeah. right. Yeah. yeah, you can do it if you already know the person and yeah. trust them. But you build up, that in. Pick up a culture of an organization to a different matter. Yeah. If you want to, I see you standing there. Time? <laughs> Larry, Ed, Alex, I think that's roughly the order of seniority here, if for we sure. <laughs> sort of. Um, thank you so much um, for doing this for us tonight and all the um, enlightening comments and taking all the great questions from everyone. Congratulations again on the book. Um, for those of you online, also um, thank you for joining us. This is the end of the event.